Welcome to ICN Sunday Morning. I'm Jamie Smith Hopkins, Managing Editor at Inside Climate News. Iowa produces a lot of pork and beef. That means it also produces a lot of animal manure, which has to go somewhere. Frequently it's applied to fields as fertilizer, but if it's not handled very carefully, some of it ends up swept into waterways. That keeps happening, in fact, polluting drinking water sources in Iowa and contributing to a massive dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Joining me to talk about that this morning is Annika Jane Beamer, ICN's terrific Iowa reporter, who wanted to understand how regulators in the state approach the problem. She teamed up with Sentient Media on a story, and the headline says it all. Factory farms in Iowa generate 110 billion pounds of manure per year. No one tracks where it's going. Uh, so Annika Jane, uh, give us the quick overview first. How are hogs and cattle raised in Iowa, and what are the environmental implications of that? Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, so I sometimes joke that if you drove through Iowa with your nose plugged, you would have no idea that we're a leading livestock producer. And that's because the majority of those animals are raised in confinement. There are nearly 8,000 medium to large concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, in the state. And these are enclosed structures where a large number of animals can be fed and maintained in a very small area which leaves the rest of the land available for row crops. So this is super different from states like Montana, where you see vast swaths of land dedicated to cattle ranching. Um, but because these animals aren't grazing and defecating over a pasture or feedlot, all of the urine and feces that they produce is um, correct, collected on site, usually in a pit that's directly below the building. And not only is animal manure um, the leading cause of agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, um, there's a there's a physical volume challenge. So if that manure pit fills up, producers can't bring in a new batch of animals, and they're faced with this challenge of getting rid of manure as quickly as possible. So we see issues with overflowing pits, sometimes even intentional dumping of that manure. But for the most part, farmers are going to try and give manure from their animals to row crop farmers to use as fertilizer. And in theory, it's really kind of a win-win. That manure has a useful end. Farmers get uh, an organic substance that's rich in nitrogen and phosphorus that their plants need, plus all these other micronutrients and microbes that are good for soil. Um, but the problem with manure, as with any fertilizer, comes when more is put on a field than the plants can reasonably use. So the excess nitrogen in particular, which is converted to nitrate in the soil, can leach into waterways um, and that's where it fuels algal blooms, like the one in the dead zone in Gulf of Mexico, but also just accumulates to dangerously high levels um, in drinking water sources and waterways. And that's a really big problem in Iowa right now. The state has some of the worst nitrate pollution of waterways in the country. Um, it's the leading contributor to that dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and it's something that the state is really having a reckoning with right now, despite decades, honestly, of gradually worsening nitrate pollution. Thanks, Annika Jane. Now, that was a great overview. I was wondering if you could sort of, uh, you know, open up the curtain for us. Um, how did you discover this particular story? I love the behind the story stories. Yeah. Um, well, I've been curious about manure for a while. I actually used to research manure. Um, and I've been particularly curious about the point where manure goes from a natural, helpful fertilizer to an environmental threat. And so I wanted to see where in the state of Iowa manure was being spread and specifically where it might be being spread in excess. Um, hauling manure is expensive, and so I know that farmers are kind of limited in where they can send the manure produced by their livestock. And I was curious what that meant for over amplification. Um, so I submitted in the summer a records request with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and I asked to see all um, 8,000 or so manure management plans. These are documents that CAFO owners submit to the state that say, this is how many animals I have, this is about how much manure they produce, and these are the fields where I plan to apply that manure. Um, so I asked for those files, and the DNR's response was, there is simply no way. Uh, an employee called me to explain that not all of the records were digitized, they weren't all in one place, and so pulling all those documents would take them about two years and cost them $90,000. Oh. And that stunned me. Like, how could they possibly have any oversight if that's what it would take just to get the documents all in one place? Um, and from there, I started asking different questions, questions about how manure management plans are reviewed, how they're stored, and um, what ability the state has, if any, to glean actual data from those plans.
Uh, yeah, I, I remember you, uh, you know, um, uh, keeping track of of what you could see on some of the the plans that you did end up getting your hands on. And, um, you know, it was just really interesting to see you digging into this and finding stuff that uh, we had no idea about. Yeah, these are these are and these are big documents. They can range from 20 pages to 100, depending on how many animals a CAFO has and thus how much land they need to land a plant manure. Yeah. Um, you your overview, I think, got at this a bit, but can you walk out a little bit more why this issue is important for islands? Yeah, so, I mean, specifically the issue of manure management planning is relevant because Iowa is not likely to stop producing manure at this scale. It's become an extremely efficient and important state for satisfying kind of the national appetite for meat. So as long as that's the case, it's really important that the state have in place a good system to protect waterways and drinking water sources and its residents. And what the reporting that Nina El Alcadi and I did found is that the DNR right now has very little ability to do that mm -hmm. with the current manure management system. What, what surprised you as you reported, besides being surprised at that initial answer you got about uh, you know, how, how much it would take to bring all the plans together? Yeah, I mean, maybe it's just the journalist's desire for data, but I was really shocked by the data blind spots that the state has. I asked a few folks at the DNR whether the agency could give a number of, like, based on all the manure management plans they received, how many gallons of manure were planned for application in a given year, if they could just pull the number from all of the documents. And they said, no, we can't do that. So these are, these are paper forms that are scanned and uploaded to an internal database, but none of the information that they contain can be looked at in aggregate. Um, and that really surprises me. I mean, if you're collecting data that isn't usable, what's the point, honestly? That's how I feel about it. Yeah, what, what is the point? Is it just a box checking exercise? I would say to a, a certain extent, yes. Um, there is an initial review that these forms go through, but that really is the epitome of a box checking exercise. It's, you know, have you submitted the right um, check based on the number of animals you have? Uh, and is anything here absolutely ludicrous? But the majority of these plans aren't gonna go under, go through any technical review that would um, impact the application of manure. Well, and you also got at this a little bit at your excellent overview, but why should people outside of Iowa care about how Iowa is handling this? Well, um, first of all, water doesn't obey state boundaries. You know, I was bordered on each side by a pretty major river, the Missouri and the Mississippi. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that feeds into the Gulf of Mexico, which has critical repercussions for this vast marine ecosystem. Um, and also there are lessons to be learned. I was not the only state with CAFOs. And as I mentioned, I don't know that um, manure or fertilizer use is likely to dwindle. But if we continue to expand industrial agriculture at the rate we're doing it, this is going to become more and more of a problem. And we need to have safeguards and systems in place to keep track of things like where 100 billion pounds of manure is going. Makes sense. Well, on that note, are there any clear solutions to the shortcomings your story examined? Yeah, I mean, the good news is yes. It's, it's nice to look at a regulatory issue and find solutions. So um, first of all, I mentioned that these forms are paper. Mm -hmm. And... A, a simple solution would be to have these manure management form, forms be completed digitally, such that each field populates a data set, and that would allow the state to actually pull data from all these forms, much more easily monitor and draw conclusions about where manure is going and how much. Um, part of that would also mean that the maps that are in these plans, hand-drawn maps where farmers have maybe highlighted or circled a field where they're going to apply manure, um, if those could be in a workable digital form, the DNR would have a way better ability to say like, oh, this field is in multiple plans. That's probably something that we should check in on, make sure that we're communicating with them or inspecting more to make sure that manure isn't being applied to that field eight times. Um, and finally, the state could reverse existing legislation that says that the actual records of manure application are confidential. So right now, the DNR receives these forms, which are proposed application. They're the plan for where manure will go. Mm -hmm. But they don't say where manure is actually spread. And those forms exist. Uh, licensed manure haulers, the companies that do this spreading, they have to produce those forms for their clients. Um, but the state deems them confidential information. If that weren't the case, the DNR could request those for forms instead of the plans. And that would make sure that any oversight ability they have is a lot more accurate and true to what's happening.
Yeah, no, I mean, those are, uh, as you say, it's always really interesting to see when there really are some clear things that can happen because there are plenty of complicated problems where it's, there just are maybe some clear steps or they feel like 10,000 steps. Those are Right. a few really clear ones. Well, so take a bunch of steps back for me now. Uh, what was your journey to ICN like and how does your past experience play into your current beat? Yeah, well, so my journey to ICN um, was at one point unpredictable because I wanted to be a scientist. Um, I studied biology at Grinnell College here in Iowa. And um, while I was there, I researched manure from a nearby CAFO. And I was specifically looking at the microbial contents of that manure um, and looking for antibiotic resistance genes, whole other, whole other era. Uh, and towards the end of my time in college, I grew really interested in, in the notion of science writing as a tool to kind of bridge the gap between researchers and the people that their research is actually uh, impacting. I worked for two years in Iowa as a science writer. Um, and then I went to grad school to study science writing at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I was recently reviewing my application for that program uh, on behalf of a prospective student. And I had written my admissions essay about manure in Iowa and how it was a really valuable tool with which to examine the interplay of science and society, you know, kind of the reckoning that science is very imperfect and very bold and influenced by our own society. Um, I think it's fascinating how manure makes us grapple with this notion of sustainable agriculture. When does a green fix become a problem? Um, and can anything ever really be siloed as environmentally good or environmentally bad? Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I mean, it's, uh, did you have any idea when you were writing, uh, you know, that, uh, that essay that you would end up literally getting to cover this issue? No, and certainly not one year later. Yeah, remarkably full circle. Yeah. And I um, not many people want to write about manure as their job, but I do. <laughs> and Yes. I get to. <laughs> Well, and I, I think, you know, you, because you understand so well, you help explain to people why they should care too, because it really does affect um, a whole lot of people. Yeah, and it's not an inherently bad thing. I mean, manure, Sure. so it's pretty easy to write that off as a problem, but this would be an issue at any scale. Um, it's just more so the issue of regulation and lack of oversight and kind of turning a blind eye to something that could help us make the world a little bit more livable. Well, we're really glad that you're here covering Iowa and these important issues. And um, thank you so much for being here today talking about them, Monica Jane. Uh, Yeah. and thanks to all of you for watching and supporting our journalism. We could not do this work without you.